these C and Cs and all this type of stuff from the 70s are collectible now because it's kind of hard to find them in working order. And they're kind of hilarious sometimes. Some of them sound just like Reagan from The Exorcist. Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. Hello again, everybody. Thanks for joining me. I'm George, the Antique Nomad. And today we're at a big antique mall in the middle of nowhere. I say the middle of nowhere because we're in Gilbertsville, Kentucky, which is a tiny, tiny town, and we're actually three miles outside this tiny town. But the middle of nowhere is really the middle of somewhere. This antique mall, which I first came to about 10 years ago, is Twin Lakes Antique Mall, and it's on Highway 641 in the land between the lakes area, which is between Lake Barkley and Kentucky Lake. And it is a big tourist area, and so they get people from about 11 surrounding states who come here for vacation because they have second homes on the lake, that sort of thing. So even though we're far away from people, we are actually in the middle of a big antique center right here. So let's go in and see. Um, full disclosure, I'm actually a dealer here now. It's my only Midwestern location. I decided to open here because I'd been here a bunch of times and it's really clean, really well run. The staff are friendly and the quality is good. So we'll uh, come on in and take a look here. So right away coming in the door, you see lots of displays of colorful glass and big antique things. There's a nice set of Yadro figures here on the counter. These are good quality. This one particularly is a harder piece to find. And so I was uh, impressed uh, you see something good right when you walk in. I noticed a big case full of carnival glass, and these seem to be early pieces from the early 1900s because they have the right kind of iridescence, so they're not the shiny stuff from the 60s and 70s. But the thing that drew me into this space was actually these, because... I do sales in Florida, and she has a great hibiscus on her. It says she is... Lego Japan, L-E-G-O, and she is based on a really famous Danish design from that time that was then copied in the United States and then copied again in Japan. So this is kind of the third hand copy, but she's cute and she's in good shape and she's only $11. And in Florida, well, she's going to go for a lot more than that. So I'm taking her with me. We're going to see 170 different dealer displays, so we're going to go through fast enough for you to get the flavor of it, and then at some point we'll have to come back and maybe go a little deeper here. I'm going to set her on the counter. Someone looks like they're getting a bunch of Fenton Carnival glass, actually, as we speak. Coming around the corner here, the buildings all are lined up with each other, so it's kind of row after row that are similar. Fortunately, they've got big space numbers, so you can kind of keep track of where you're going. These are really fun because these are Royal Hager and their decanters. There was a whole musician series from about 1970. That Royal Hager label was done in the 1960s and 70s primarily, before they used a lot of ink stamps on them instead. And I believe there were six or eight different musicians in the line. They're very collectible now. They sell for about 45 to 65 apiece, and these are marked 65 for the pair, so this might just be something to pick up. Now, I do see some furniture at this store, and wicker is actually something that sells really well, and these prices are great. It's more of a spring thing, and I don't really have a place to put it, but I have to say if I did, I would get these, because the table is only 20 bucks and the sofa is 75 which is really inexpensive for good quality wicker. And these are older pieces. They look like they're probably 1950s, 60s era. There's a lot of things that you see in the Midwest here, a lot of elegant glass, depression glass, a lot of crockery and that sort of thing. But we're going to keep our eye out for some special things to show you as well, things you don't uh, necessarily see so much. One piece here I noticed is this Gone with the Wind lamp, probably a 1960s piece. A lot of people have the idea that these are older than they are because of the name Gone with the Wind, which was sort of derived from the movie 
but actually it's more just a style. And it was a style that was really popular in the 60s, and so we see a lot of lamps from that time. And a lot of younger people are getting into that because it's stuff their grandparents had. This space also has a lot of cool Pyrex, and of course Pyrex is a thing we have a lot of collectors for now. I see some really good colors in there. I am actually looking for non-glass items right now because I just got a whole bunch of Pyrex and Corning wear. Oh, here's something cool. This Pepsi sign here is interesting to me because this actually shows a black couple and that's going to date to late 60s, early 70s before they changed the logo from the bottle cap. And the thing that's unusual about those is that until the 60s, really, there wasn't a lot of advertising directed for black people. There were a lot of caricatures and things like we see up here with Aunt Jemima and Uncle Mose and that sort of stuff that were not really made for black people. So the fact that we're seeing realistic depictions means it's late 60s, also means it's very collectible and fairly valuable because that was a pretty new concept. The marketers finally came to the fact that black people have purchasing power and so they started to do things for them. So this is a big oak stacking drawer here and these are very desirable now. People just love anything that's got a lot of cubby holes. Oh and I see inside they left car model applications 1957. So everything you need for your General Motors, your 57 Chevy I guess is in there. I'm going to show real quickly as we go by a really colorful space. This is full of Fiesta wear, and a lot of these colors are colors that are discontinued. Fiesta has been made since the 1930s, and while I personally go mainly for the original color, there is a lot of people interested in this, and it's actually kind of hard to get because it's so popular. Homer Lachlan has never been able to really keep up with the demand and they limit who can actually buy those items. This is one thing about being in a place like this is that you get kind of pulled around when you're shopping because the next shiny object comes into view. And I just noticed some records and I wanted to look at those. Stan Kenton, an old jazz guy, June Christie, Chet Atkins. I mean, a lot of people are into vinyl these days. I'm more into rock era, but let's see what they've got on the other side here. Oh, wow, okay, here we go. <laughs> This is cool to me. Building on the Rock, songs and stories by Jim and Tammy and their friends. And oh my goodness, it's only a dollar and a half. Okay, I have to get this. Don't know if you'll recognize, but if any of you were alive in the 1980s, you might remember the PTL Club scandal where Jim Baker was apparently, with help from some of his cohorts, taking a lot of money that was supposed to be donated to keep their theme park and their church going, and they were living a very large lifestyle, and it became a huge national scandal in the late 80s. But these were back when they were just a nice little uh, preacher couple who did a children's show in Memphis. Finding the records is actually pretty hard, and I'm going to get this because this is very collectible now. Another thing that we see in this mall a lot, and I want to take a look at this one because it's a good color, is quilts. This looks like a 1930s. And it is hand-pieced and hand-quilted with the polka dots in this sort of herringbone pattern. And what I uh, like about it is the color. It's $99, which is probably about the right price, so not something that I can take home. But I always look to bring quilts here because we're really close to Paducah, Kentucky. Paducah has the National Quilt Museum, and they have two big events every year. There's vintage quilt shows, there's a contest with new quilts, there's some just amazing things made there. So uh, because of that, lots of people come here looking for quilts and linens, and so you'll see a lot of that as we go through today. This is a wash stand that would have actually been in the um, 1890s where the top actually folds down so that you're able to use the top as a surface. This would have been for a small apartment or a hotel room. And it's got this interesting metal banding, which is typical of about 1900 to 1910. Uh, a lot of English pieces are done that way, and I suspect that is a European piece. And then one other thing that's very desirable now are these old wooden rolling industrial racks. Some of these were from shoe stores. Some of these were from bakeries used for bread. This one's priced, uh, it's, this one says it's a baker's drying rack. It's priced about $2.95. That's about what I got for the last one I had. Next to it, you see a really great wall-mounted sifter from about 1890 with ships painted on it, toll painted. And this would have been for 
some sort of a commercial place. This wouldn't have been something you would have seen in the home. So again, very hard to find now because so much of the metal stuff was destroyed during the Second World War during the scrap drives. Kitchenware is something that if you like the way that old stuff cooks, you'll find good pieces in antique malls. You'll find cast iron. You'll find guardian ware, which is really heavy cast aluminum from the 30s and 40s. And a lot of people like to cook in that because it gives you a different result than microwaving. Across the aisle, more carnival. And I see a set in there that's really pretty unusual. So I'd like to take a look at it. It is Fenton. And a lot of people think of Fenton as being you know, hobnail glass from the 60s that grandma had, but actually Fenton started about 1905. And these are really early pieces here. Uh, this is the uh, butterfly and fern pattern, and it is not easy to find. I've always wanted to have one of these to sell. It's a one-man band. You can have your own parade. It shakes, it rings, it doesn't sound like the bell's in it anymore, and if you had a nice uh, stick, you could do like a wood block on it. But these are just sort of a crazy contraption. You can have your own parade. This one is a little more than I can pay for it, so it's going to stay here. But it is priced right for uh, retail. And every so often, I'll see some crazy person in a parade sporting one of those. So uh, there are people looking for that kind of thing. These are swim fins, and I think the cool thing about them is really the box. <laughs> and it's from Kmart. Satisfaction always. Yeah, that was their logo back in the 70s, and I can tell you I was rarely satisfied going into a Kmart. They, they tried real hard. Not hard enough, though. They're mostly out of business now. However, these are kind of neat, and they might be a good Florida item. A whole so. bunch of Ertl pieces in here. They've got the American made with the Case tractor and the International tractor. And Ertl is out of Iowa, but they no longer uh, produce the stuff there. It's pretty much made overseas. So people look for the old American ones because that's more what people had when they were kids. I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of nostalgia for Chinese-made items. If we go this way, we start getting into a bunch of showcases, and maybe we'll find something uh, fun in here. This one has 75% off, and they have all sorts of little itty-bitty interesting things. And... Uh, advertising things and soda fountain things and some fraternal buttons and political things and all sorts of the little junk that I like to put in cases that sells well at shows. So I'll have to come back and comb through that. This case we'll show you just because I don't think we've seen any of this before in any of our episodes. Um, this is Capo di Monte made in Italy. These pieces with the big applied flowers are mostly 1960s and 70s, and they are hard to find in good condition, and you can imagine why. Um, even some of these pieces, you'll see an odd nick or chip or crack on occasion there. It is something that a lot of people, again, remember from the 1960s and 70s from Grandma's house. Down in the bottom, that big piece that just was shown is a Roseville Donatello jardinier. That's from about 1915, and very hard to find both pieces in good condition. They got knocked over a lot, and the bowl on top usually got broken into smithereens. Here's another case with stuff that I like and will definitely come back for. I think I might want that General Motors locomotive sign. In fact, I'm sure of it. That's off the front of one of the early diesel train engines, and it says April 1952. That's just when they were starting to come out. They've also got a bunch of railroad keys, and I have a lot of collectors for railroad keys, so I have a feeling I will come back and clear a lot of that case out. Railroad keys are these funny shapes here, and they're kind of thick, and they have a hole at the end because they go in these locks like you see to the left here. So they're very specific, and they're marked with the initials of the railroad so that you could tell one from another if you were out on the lines. You can't see too much. You can only see the top one here, but these are Pontiac advertisements from 1959 when they had the gigantic fins on the Pontiacs. Those are a set of 27, and they all have illustrations of Native Americans. It's because Pontiac had the chieftain car. Pontiac was an Indian, so they had the Pontiac chieftain, and from that, the advertising. These stretched out kitty cat salt and pepper shakers are something that we always sell. Now, their price on it is definitely uh, what they should be, so no room for me, but they are really cute. I don't know why these things always sound like they're possessed. If you can... Okay, that sounded like something.
okay, that was patty cake. That one almost sounded nice. These C and Cs and all this type of stuff from the 70s are collectible now because it's kind of hard to find them in working order. And they're kind of hilarious sometimes. Some of them sound just like Reagan from The Exorcist. <laughs> This is a sanitary scale made in Illinois in about 1930, and it was a big deal. These computing scales, it used to be that it was very difficult until about uh, 1900 when a fellow in Louisville got a bunch of patents on these, and he made it possible for this to do all the weighing and computing in one unit as opposed to multiple units where you had to move things around. And there was always a lot of suspicion that people were putting their thumb on the scale or adding to it in the old days. This cut that out. And it also was good for the new self-service grocery stores that started appearing about 1920. This one has an inspector seal from 1955 from Cahoga County, Ohio. So that's probably the last time this was used in a store. Both Shawnee and the Stanford Company from Ohio made the cornware. And this particular set is Stanford because their yellow was a little more creamy yellow as opposed to the Shawnee, which was brighter. And a lot of people really enjoy cornware as a collectible. And I haven't had any for a while. It's one of the forms of kitchen and dinnerware that still sells well. Oh, the Yellow Tiger is great, isn't it? It was priced at 40 and now he's 20, which is a good deal. That chartreuse color is a late 1950s shade. And yeah, he's a, he's a good tiger. He probably had a rhinestone eye originally. Um, that would be pretty easy to put back in. And if you ever go to Graceland, you're going to see a large black striped version of that in the jungle room because Elvis just loved it and would not let it go. He would not let Priscilla get rid of that when she tried to redecorate everything. We don't see a lot of this sort of thing. This is cold fudge. This is the 1930s. We don't see these a lot because they were in uh, soda fountains and store top displays. So they weren't really made for home use. So they would have made a fraction of the number that they would have made if that was something to use at home. This space to the right here I see has a lot of license plates and there's one that is a type I've always wanted to find. I've never owned one yet and I doubt I'll own one after this because everyone around here knows what they are. But in Illinois during the Second World War and a little bit after, they made these and they look like cardboard. They're actually made out of pressed soybeans. And this was something that was done to save metal during the war. I'm surprised more states didn't do it because they don't rust out or anything like the old metal ones do. Uh, but they're an interesting novelty in license plate collecting that people look out for. And I, I do too, but I haven't found any that I can buy yet. Uh, the Keebler Elf. That's a 1970s piece. We see a lot of stuff that was branded for them. They were very popular in the 70s. And you'll see cookie jars that look like a tree with the Keebler elves. And those were actually made by Francoma pottery, even though they're painted to look like the Keebler tree and they don't look anything like other Francoma that you associate. Blue ball jars galore. That's definitely still a thing. And there are a lot of different varieties here. Uh, your earlier ones are usually going to say patent 1858 and these are the ones that get to be pricier. We see a lot of the regular standard blue ball jar but uh, when you get into the older patents here's another one this has the November 30th 1858 patent. There are a few of these that were done in the early days in some really odd colors like purple that are really valuable. They can be in the hundreds of dollar ranges. Most of the blue ones are around 10 or 12 dollars unless they're older models though. And of course, because we're in Kentucky, we've got a whole bunch of Kentucky Derby glasses. Derby stuff is very popular here, and I enjoy it too. So this piece is a Rabia from Finland with the bull on it. And I wanted to show you this because we do see interesting, fun, modernist pieces. It isn't just traditional antiques, even though we're in the heartland. The 1950s and 60s did not pass anybody by, and a lot of people were interested in things that were fresh and new. And this was definitely an example of that uh, with the stylized bull. There's a nice mark on the bottom that says Arabia. If you see this in thrift stores, a lot of times people don't really know that it's something desirable, but almost anything they made is collectible now, and definitely something worth picking up. 
here's a whole bunch of vintage Christmas. You see the old wind-up church with the music box in it, with the light that comes through, and a whole lot of reindeer. Blown ornaments, a lot of these are pretty popular now. It's all about nostalgia. All the stuff that we remember from when we were kids is what ends up getting our attention when we get older, and there's a good example of that. And then down on the bottom, we've got that nice blow mold to the left with the Santa and the sled. And the styrofoam Santa, those usually got broken into a million pieces. Here we have the now ubiquitous green ceramic Christmas tree. They have really come back out of uh, people's uh, houses and collections and are suddenly very popular again. If you're looking for more information about stuff you see here, this is at TwinLakesAntiqueMall.com. We have some grab bag kind of jars. These can be fun for people. You buy a jar and you get the contents. So like this one's got a bunch of skeleton keys. That's probably worth the price just for the keys. Who knows what's in some of this stuff. Uh, a lot of times dealers, they might come into an estate where they have to take everything and there's a whole drawer full of whatever. And sometimes they'll just throw it in a jar and sell it like that. And you can find some pretty cool things in those jars sometimes. The kangaroo is a caddy and that would have gone on a guy's desk in the 50s. They were made somewhere in the U.S. and I think they were sold through Esquire magazine. Esquire sold a lot of oddball desk things. They even sold condom holders that were shaped like egg-shaped heads with a face on them that said think, which I guess is good advice. This space here is neat because it's got more of a primitive and country look and this is the sort of thing that we expect to see in this part of the country. And I see some good pieces here. Um, this bread bowl with the lid is an interesting piece. You had to let the uh, dough rise and the idea of the lid was so that bugs and things weren't getting into it while you left it out. This is going to be a piece from the 1800s, something that someone just made for themselves because you couldn't just expect to buy everything back then. Uh, there's also a good coverlet over there with the red and white stars. Uh, coverlets in that kind of wool with that patterning usually date to about the between the 1840s and the 1880s and they can be worth a few hundred dollars. And then of course crockery, very popular in this part of the country. I have to be honest, I don't buy crocs here, I sell them here. I bring everyone I get to this place because we get better money for them here than anywhere else. It just matches the interests and the decor in the area. There's a couple dealers here that do a lot with tools. And there are some really good displays. I mean, everything from calipers to levels to woodworking planes. They find them, they oil them. There is a lot of interest in tool collecting. And a lot of these actually end up being put back into use. It's not just to look at or hang on the wall. Although, as you see from this display, you can do that and make it look pretty cool too. I like this guy. He's the uh, vintage bubble blowing monkey. He's similar to the bartender. You would wind him up or put batteries in him and then he, you'd actually put some fluid in with uh, soapy water and then it would blow bubbles out of its mouth. It's a little dilapidated, but it's pretty cute. I really like buggy seats and this one's a pretty good one. They're actually very saleable. They're good for shoe benches at the front door. I've had a lot of luck with these when I've had them before. They usually don't last long. The horse and buggy era, this one's priced at 200 That's really not a bad price. So that's something I'll have to consider because these are actually much more prized in other parts of the country where they're harder to find. I had one of these in Seattle and I think I got 350 for it and it sold immediately. There's a lot of oil memorabilia and petroleana here in this space. A pretty collectible thing. These seem to be full. And so I guess if you need a quart of oil and you're desperate, you could break into your collection. But anytime we see anything with the old Shell logo or the Gulf logo, uh, we know that there's collectors for that. You'll see a lot of off-brands as well, some regional stuff, and sometimes people are more interested in that. These are mostly fantasy items here, although I do see the Amprol um, thermometer is actually an old one. I'm curious what they have on that because that's got good graphics. $55.99. That's not bad. That's about what a good advertising thermometer from that era would go for. Now here we've got a gaming wheel. Speaking of gambling devices, this one is going to be one of the old wheels of fortune from about 1910. This is an unusual thing that you really don't see very often and in really nice condition. But I have never before seen a sink that actually had Wedgwood Jasperware handles on it. That's a first for me. I've been doing this for a while now, so I'm 
definitely surprised to see those. I know a lot of Wedgwood collectors, and they've never mentioned seeing these before. We're going to show you another space with, again, tools, but this guy really, really gets the stuff. And he gets some really early stuff. These uh, sorts of grinders, you can tell by this sort of embossing here. This is going to date to right around 1900, and this is an old apple peeler, actually. Peeler and corer. And then we've got uh, grinders galore, and he's got a uh, very nicely oiled um, double-handled saw. Tons of hammers, uh, tractor seats, wagons, uh, any of that sort of thing. This is probably the most popular space with guys, not in just in this mall, but in just about any mall I've been involved with. There are always people there, which is fortunate for me because I'm right across the aisle. So this is my space here, and I'm about to take it apart and put in a bunch of uh, fresh stuff. I've got some big proppy things like an old oak icebox and a big old 1930s blue washing machine and a big steamer trunk. I've got a bunch of Sebastian's figurines that have come in. I see one of them has had a great fall, so he's going to go away. These are from about the 1940s to the 1980s. That's a big collection that I got out of Florida. It's even got the stand below that you put the guys on. I've got some Native American basketry, some Alaskan as well as some Midwestern and Northeast tribal pieces. I'm selling a big collection for a consigner. These are Seneca driftwood glass pieces from about 1970. A lot of people really like this pattern because the texturing means that uh, if you're holding it like a cocktail glass or a tumbler and it sweats, you're not going to drop it on a hot summer day because you've got something to grab onto. Plus it gives it a good look. The orange crackle piece, that's a pilgrim glass piece from about 1960. And I see that they also have this kind of oddball little scooter chair here. This would have been something that some kid back in the 1920s or 30s would have rolled around in. And the thing is, is that's probably as safe as could be. You know, they keep saying, oh, every generation, you got to get rid of all your kids' old toys and things because they're not safe anymore. That looks like you couldn't do anything to it. This space here says it has lots of thimbles, so let's take a look. I have a feeling they're porcelain collector thimbles. And... Oh yes, indeed. They certainly do. It looks like something from everywhere that somebody went. I see everything from birds to Las Vegas to North Carolina in there. But what I also noticed in this space is the Radco wear. Christopher Radco Christmas stuff is definitely collectible. It's not wildly old, but it has the old look and a lot of people really like Radco. Now my first question, because he's a funny color of pink, is whether he's real or not. So let's take a look here at the bottom and see if we can tell. Okay, the bottom looks like an American Bisque Company piece because it's got this sort of funny shape in the middle and this looks like it could be real. It's certainly heavy and thick like a real piece. It's just not one that I've encountered before. And if I'm reading that right, it's $15 minus 10%. The dealer thinks it's vintage. I think it's vintage and I think it's going with me. So there we go. They also have a bunch of the Treasure Craft barrel line. I wrote the book on this company and the barrels came out in the mid fifties. They made that rubbed on brown color so that they could make it look like wood or uh, skin when they did dancers like the Spanish dancers or the Hawaiian dancers or the bull and matador. But then they came up with the idea of doing the barrels as a set of canister. And this particular cookie jar ended up on the set of the Dick Van Dyke show, which was really popular in its time. And as soon as it got on TV with the product placement, they sold, I think, something like 50,000 of that cookie jar over the next five years. So you will see the barrel line around. And there's a very green dog cookie jar that looks like a 1960s or early 70s from Japan. Bunch of 50s era pitchers and glassware here. And then the blendo glass up on top here. 
that's only priced at 15. That's actually a pretty good deal. I might take that as well. Uh, those were made by the West Virginia Glass Company, and people really like that color that gradates like that. I've had a lot of luck selling these for about 25 to 30 dollars. It's the Penguin Hot Cold Keeper. These came out in the 1930s and they were so popular that they actually made them for about 40 years. So they're not actually that hard to find, but they're very desirable still. People like it because of the shape. You can put ice in it and it will, it's got a nice rubber seal so everything stays cold. It doesn't sweat because it's actually got two wall construction. Uh, so as a practical thing, they're actually really useful and they have that great deco look. So that's the reason that we see people buying these. Um, this one's priced at about uh, 25 which is about the going rate for them. There is a lot more to this store that I would love to show you, but there's so much more that I think we probably ought to do a separate uh, video for the second half of the store. With that, I guess I will wrap up here in Christmas land. Styrofoam Santa head on one side of me and a vintage gold Santa head on the other side of me. That is one glittery, shiny thing. I have never seen that one before. But lots of interest in anything blow mold. Thanks so much for being with us, and it was really good to have you viewing. Please follow us, subscribe, tell your friends. We are at The Antique Nomad. We have daily posts on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube every Wednesday. So we'll look forward to you there. Thanks so much now. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below, click the bell to be notified when new videos upload, leave a comment below, and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at The Antique Nomad. Bye for now!